Thank you, Bernd. Uh, thank you so much for the invitation. I've really been looking forward. Uh, I was checking out the homepage of, of uh, the Research Institute here and really found it interesting. I mean, Bernd and I goes, I guess we met each other about 20 years ago or something like that. And we had prolonged discussion at the time whether we were allowed to talk about magic at all. I mean, Dan, at the time, was an ardent opponent, and I was the ardent defender of using the concept. I think now we are probably approaching each other uh, more in terms of this. So in the, um, in the abstract I sent you, I was uh, maybe placing a bit more emphasis on this terminological discussion. I'll touch a bit upon it in the beginning, but I'd rather actually spend a bit more time on trying to uh, explain to you and show you how I kind of connect my older work and, and uh, the idea of these kind of basic cognitive operations in terms of why magic is around with, with this new approach, which uh, is more about why uh, certain social formations stabilize at particular levels of complexity and, and what the role of, in particular, ritual is there. But then I'll focus on on what magic seems to be doing in that. So that's why I call it in, as a social mediation. So uh, the, the kind of key word there is that I believe magic is doing something that relates family, levels of the family with levels of the community. And it, it's that potential conflict that magic seems to have a kind of pivotal function in, in negotiating. But I just uh, send around the book uh, as Dan mentioned um, it's free, it's open access um, for people if they want to. There's interesting artwork by an Austrian uh, artist who put herself in a life-size petri dish and then grew her biomic bacteria on it. So you can study how that develops over time in the book. Okay, so my background, I won't say more, more about it because Bernd did it, uh, Bernd did it so well. Uh, so I'll just uh, skip on to this idea of the contentious concepts. Uh, and, and this is not to reiterate uh, my discussion with Bernd uh, some, some years back, but more, I think, a general discussion in the humanities and the sign of the crisis of the humanities uh, as I see it today. All our concept seems to be under attack, both from within and from without. It goes for magic, it goes for religion, and it also actually goes for culture. I mean, the, the concept of culture is actually, even though it's been gaining prominence in the public discourse as an uh, explanatory concept used to explain people's behavior, so we explain behavior by reference to culture, especially in multicultural societies, uh, in academia, the star of culture is declining rapidly. A lot of people would actually uh, go without it. So you have both kind of attacks from the kind of deconstructivist uh, critical theory, saying that that this is just a kind of economic term and it's uh, homogenizing uh, particular types of behavior. And then you have the attack from from people in the cognitive sciences and, and, and behavioral ecologists, et cetera, who basically say that cultures are epiphenomenal, that we can explain cultures just kind of the aggregate behavior of individual persons. And I think uh, both of these uh, approaches are wrong. So I have a discussion of that. And I basically think that we do not gain much from what I call terminological cleansing that this idea of, of I think it's, a, I, I, I mean, even though we should perform genealogies about our concept and we should, of course, be critical about whether they are the right type of explanatory uh, instrument. There's two, I mean, in a certain sense, I think I'm a pragmatist in the sense, I think if you do the criticism, come up with a better model. I think that's a prerogative of it, but... And I think uh, some of the problems that arise is, is a misconception of what models are. It's interesting that e even, I would argue, even postmodernists are actually implicit positivist in their understanding of what concepts are, because what they tend to implicitly argue is that concepts should correspond directly to the world. And no concept corresponds to the world. Concepts are our models of the world by which we try to get a grasp on this thing out there which we don't really, following Kant, have any direct access to. I mean, we need concepts to understand the world. Uh, mm -hmm. This is an old uh, insight, I think, and what, I, I mean, so in that sense, the 
cognitive model I'm lying out in order to understand uh, ritual is actually feeding back on science itself and what is the 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 kind of uh, what science is really about as a social process of a lot of people trying to reach some kind of understanding. If we talk about that, so, so terms are not concepts. I mean, I think that's pretty important. I think there's a lot of the problem of, of a lot of the genealogical stuff is that it's arguing, here's a concept, people meant this evil thing about it with it 500 years ago, therefore we shouldn't use the concept today. And it's kind of, what? I mean, we have so many concepts that changed, well, oh, sorry, so many terms that are eliciting different concepts today than they used to. So I think a better way ahead might be to, to make much more explicit what we mean by these concepts and how what are the models underlying that. So this was actually the attempt I did in 2007 to do with, with magic and see this as a kind of that there were, I think Fraser was basically right, that there are regularities in ritual behavior around the world that we should try to explain, even though I don't buy Fraser's explanation, ex except that he's kind of his taxonomy of, of different types of procedures seems to be pretty much on the mark. Uh, as uh, act or already remarked actually by Roman Jacobson, uh, the linguist, about 50 years ago. I think also there's something about the levels of description. I mean, you could criticize Fraser for saying that he used magic to explain stuff. And I'm not sure magic is a very kind of strong kind of explanatory term. Actually, I think it's more something we need to explain. A bit like culture, actually. So there might be a change here in, in what we are actually aiming at. We can't say that, we can't explain much by saying it's culture, because what, I mean, that's actually a criticism often raised against Clifford Geertz, right? So religion is a cultural system. So, okay, you take one concept that are problematic religion, and then you elicit it by taking an even more problematic and broader ranging concept. It's kind of difficult what we mean by it. So we need also to to get a better explanation of what we mean by culture. So, so maybe magic is more kind of a synthetic category we use to delineate an area of the world, a phenomenological range of behaviors that seem to have some similarity that calls for an explanation. That's a kind of more pragmatic approach uh, to this. The last reason I think we should not kind of just give up terms too easily is that we forget that we are part of a web of science. We're also part of a, a science also relates to the rest of, of the world. I mean, I could go out and say, yeah, I'm not talking about magic. I'm talking about ritual efficacy. So if I talked about ritual efficacy, a lot of people would say, oh, you mean magic. And then we didn't gain anything because people are still evoking the same models. So, so, so I think it's a wasted effort. And the problem, if we do it, is that we disengage ourselves from other disciplines that would heavily use that term. So psychologists would talk about magic without any problem. So they use it as auxiliary terms to make their understanding of, of some particular type of phenomenon. So, and we do that, the same thing all the time, right? We talk about the state or we talk about politics or we talk about discourse or whatever. And we can't define all these terms all the time because then we won't say anything. So we depend on other, the terms of other disciplines and other disciplines de depends on our terms. And if we just kind of get rid of them, we are disengaging ourselves from, from the rest of the sciences and also from, from the ordinary language. Magic is now a word in a lot of languages around the world. So I'm not kind of, again, I'm not sure we're gaining anything. I just think we're disengaging ourselves. We should, should redefine them instead. Uh, so that, that was what I wanted to say about terms. Now I'll get onto content instead. This was the definition that I, without knowing it, actually made in the book. I didn't, <laughs> I hadn't actually realized that it was a definition until somebody else pointed out, it extracted it from the book and said, I have a definition. Then, oh, yeah, I have. Uh, and now I kind of reappropriated it. So, so the idea was really to say that 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 rich magic was really about changing the state or essence of persons, objects, and acts, and then through a certain special and non-trivial kind of action with opaque cause and mediation. So the idea was really to say that that I what I was interested in magic was why people would have rituals they actually would believe made a difference in the world that that would function instrumentally, and this is I mean well documented everywhere that people do have strong intuitions that rituals make a difference. They do something. And I was just wondering why. I mean, this is an interesting question, why people would have these 
kind of, of ideas. And in order to elicit this, I, I was inspired. Uh, I thought that it was interesting with Fraser. I mean, everybody, there was a lot of uh, Fraser debunking some years back, right? I mean, Fraser hating was almost kind of an academic discipline in the UK, at least. But nobody seemed to touch this distinction between magic based on contagion and magic based on similarity. Everybody said, yeah, he was right there, but the rest was that was seemed to be kind of the underlying assumption. I thought, hmm, that's interesting. And then I was studying semiotics, and somebody said, you should read Roman Jakobsen. And I read Roman Jakobsen. He said, yeah, hey, it's interesting how Fraser's distinction of the two types of magic follows suit from the notion, distinction between metaphor and metonymy in language. I thought, oh, that's interesting. And then Lakoff and Johnson were putting out new theories about what metaphor and, and metonymy is really about and how it works in our brain and how we understand the world through it. I thought, hmm, okay, then we might go back to magic and look at it through through this lens and see what that would bring. So, so of course, there was the old, I mean, the idea of contagion. I'm changing Fraser somewhat because actually Fraser is only interested in magic as action at a distance. So his notion of contagious magic is, for instance, having a broom somebody have used and then by extracting the hair, I can burn it. And then because the hair used to be in contact with the person, I will hurt that person. Right. So his idea was still kind of action at a distance. Uh, I think that's a part of it, right? It's obviously there. But I was actually into what, what uh, Fraser seemed to disregard was this kind of direct idea of contagion, that essence or, or if characteristics are transferred by just by touching. And of course, we have a lot of natural inclinations to do this, right? I mean, it's a very cold day and I pour myself a cup of tea and I warm my hands and the warmth is it, it kind of permeating from the tea into my hands. So this notion that we we get something by touching is, of course, deeply seated in us. And of course, this is exploited heavily in rituals everywhere, right? Touching, ingesting, permeating the skin, whatever. I mean, all these things are believed to be able to transfer whatever essence you want, right? So that was uh, kind of the the, the one uh, basic system. The other one, of course, being uh, the the image schema or the similarity. So so basically saying that we can work something, we can manipulate and domain by a means of something that looks like it. So we don't need to touch the real person; we can just touch the effigy instead. Now, interestingly enough, these seems to touch upon very basic cognitive uh, procedures, namely our ability to create image schema tasks that underlies basic categorization. I mean, if we're not able to, to see, to, to categorize by means of similarity, we wouldn't be able to form classes of things in the world, right? I mean, one book looks like another book. It is similar to another book. Therefore, we have a class of books. So similarity is deeply embedded in, in, in all systems of classification. And, and as I mentioned, this idea of contiguity and contagion as transferring something is also based on deeply based on, on experimental uh, aspects of our life. So the question naturally arises, okay, if that's the case, if it's so normal, what then distinguishes magic from what we ordinarily do? We do this all the time. And in some sense, right. I mean, there is a critique of old aspects of magic because we do have these kind of small magical procedures going around. People probably won't throw dart uh, arrows at their loved ones, or they are hesitant to destroy certain things. You don't want to burn stuff, etc. We do have this kind of basic stuff that seems to appropriate. But I was more interested in how do we produce this so we get strong notions that, that, that something is actually happening. And therefore, I turned to ritual. And this is a kind of simplified model of trying to understand what's the difference between ordinary and ritual actions. And basically the, the reason for, for going into that is that you have actually a very, very strong research tradition in, in, in psychology broadly and in cognitive science in general on trying to understand how do we actually uh, understand actions? I mean, actions are really complicated. Also, I mean, if you want to build a robot, it's really, they found out it's incredibly hard to build up and robot able to actually do something because you move the cup just one millimeter and it will turn it over. I mean, so it's, I mean, getting these processes right is really, really complex. Uh, so this is a kind of simplified model arguing that let's say I want to smash a window. I have a precondition. I have knowledge about windows and stones and stuff like that. 
I have an idea about how this can relate to an action. I can throw the stone at the window, and I have a prognostic kind of prediction about that will smash the window. Now, look, if you look at that structure, it's pretty simple. If the rock fails to smash the window, I can kind of uh, correct my behavior, right? I can go back, I can throw harder, I can pick up a bigger rock, I can decide that my precondition was wrong, that this is actually answer class or something like that, so I won't be able to smash it. I mean, you can all do, you have all these kind of feedback loops in which you correct your actions in order to have them work. Now, the argument is pretty simple that, that in ritual, this seems to, seems to be totally disconnected. I mean, why would eating sanctified bread lead to, to, uh, to a kind of state of grace? I mean, there's no kind of implicit causal representation. I'm not saying that people don't have these representations. I'm just saying it's not... Course and, and and it's kind of do you get twice the grace if you eat two wafers? I mean, you'd say if you are hungry and you eat, if you eat two loaves of bread, you'll be less hungry. So so again, it's kind of disconnected from our basic way of engaging with the world. And the argument would be that that rituals are doing this really explicitly, right? So so that's a reason that you get a small wafer in the church and not a meal. So you're supposed to use the meal scheme at a, but at the same time kind of negate it. So you, you, that's what these uh, these uh, things are representing here. So, so the argument, the very simple version of the argument is that this in itself will raise uh, our cognitive system, will try to, to elicit other ways of understanding what's going on. And one way to do that would ex was exactly, and I mean, a lot of cognitive science have, have, uh, have indicated this is true, going for what is called weak causal cognition. And these are actually based on relations of similarity and contact. So when you don't have strong causal schemas, go for weak ones. Smart strategy, right? If things look the same, they might be the same. If things touch each other, they might transfer things. Because they do in a lot of cases. So it's a kind of safe default strategy. And this would be heightened whenever you negate the normal ordinary. So if I'm not getting full from eating this bread, what on earth is then going on? It must be doing something. My symbolist might say, yeah, but it's just a symbol. Okay, can you throw it over your left shoulder instead? Probably not. Why do I have to eat it if it's just a symbol? So, so, so it's eliciting all these kind of things. That doesn't mean, of course, that we don't have symbolic interpretations. But, but try to ask. I mean, I'm using often uh, examples from 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 Christian tradition, but you can take whatever religious tradition you want. Try to ask a, a, a kind of German uh, churchgoer what the uh, what what the uh, the Eucharist mean. And they probably have. Oh, I have to think. And the interesting thing is exactly you have to think. You have to remember back what were you told maybe in, in, in preparatory class for confirmation or what does the catechism tell you or what did the priest used to say. Of course, what anthropologists and historians of religion have usually done is ask the experts. But of course they know they are the experts. But the interesting thing, a lot of people don't know. And, they, and, then in, and in terms of cognitive science, you would say, hey, this is a slow process. You have to kind of remember you have to go into long-term memory to remember what have, what does this bread actually mean. Whereas the weak causal cognition immediately pops up. You eat something that people have behaving very strangely about, which is probably therefore powerful. Right? So you eat it. Now, this was then a stepping stone also for discussion of then what what how we could conceptualize the relation between magic and religion. I'm not a big fan of saying these are two distinct areas. I don't think. I mean, I already showed you pictures of 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 a Eucharistic ritual. I think. Uh, I mean, all rituals can probably more or less all rituals can be interpreted in a magical way. Uh, so, and I think there's a lot of fight within all institutionalized religions about kind of. What I'm trying here is kind of getting rid of all this magic. Of course, Protestantism, it's really obviously there, but it's not only there. I mean, there's, there are strong uh, anti-ritualistic trends in most institutionalized religion. And I think there's a very good reason for that, because the problem is if you just put it up as a kind of, a, a, a kind of conflict between efficacy and order or control, the problem is that the magical interpretation seems to go for perceptual features. They go for focus and purpose. They are context near. I'm supposed to gain something by eating this bread right now. It's ritual as an action. It's 
often related to charismatic authority. At least it, it can, it, I mean, strong magical procedures will often point back to the person who's able to do the ritual. And if we look at it, it's often what's related to small uh, social units. On the other hand, religion seems to be more and more focused on symbolic interpretation. Why? One of the reasons is that, that I think Pascal Boyer pointed to that in, in an interesting argument where he said that religions are also becoming brands and they need to expand, they have to homogenize their ritual procedures everywhere. So, that, so what happens in a Danish Lutheran church should be more or less the same in all the churches. So you need to control it, and you can't have people coming up for weird kind of blessings and and uh, to get bread and bring it back home and bury it under your threshold of your house, which people actually did in the Middle Ages, and the church were against it. Why? Because they lost control of what was going on. And I think another thing is that you start to focus on, on meaning of the ritual instead of what the ritual does. So it's meaning something, it's context distance, and it's seen as a sign of loyalty. So it becomes a signal of who you belong to. And of course, all the institutionalized religion or the axillage religion or wherever we want to call them have been, been fighting about loyalty, right? Because they, as soon as you have this institutionalization, you also have descending voices within and you have splinter groups, et cetera, et cetera. So ritual is very often seen as a sign of loyalty about how you should do it. And it points to, therefore to institutional authority and it's efficient in creating large social units, but at the cost of taking efficacy away from the ritual. So the more they become a symbol of loyalty, the less they do. That's interesting in itself, but I'm not going to go there. In, in the book, I'm trying to argue why this is the reason why exoticism is so prevalent in magical procedures. The less you understand, the better, right? I mean, abracadabra, hocus pocus, all that stuff everywhere seems to, you have magical languages in most traditions, and I think the reason for that is that it's heightening our perception that this is something doing stuff. It's not something meaning some, something, right? So it's, it's highlighting this. But I would like to go on with the kind of bottom there, the, the, the distinction between small social units and large social units and, and see how, whether, whether it's true that, whether we can understand what magic is or these kind of magical rituals are doing in these small units and why they seem to be prevalent there. So, so this is kind of the new definition that is made for the abstract here, I think, because I had to try to think. So the idea was that we could look at magic as the behavioral mobilization of basic cognitive procedures, which is what I just described, to effect a change related to recurring problems of what I call the nurture sphere of the extended family. And it's doing so by embedding these actions in ritualized behavioral patterns specified by or related to the sphere of the community. So, so what I'm trying to argue here is that, that humans congregate in, in social groupings of various sizes, right? We do in modern, I mean, we all do it all the time at different scales. We have a group here defined by building up a culture, right? I guess you guys are, I mean, that's what the research center is supposed to do, right? Over time build of a culture of cooperation. You have common talks that you can all talk about after Christmas saying, hey, was this weird guy from Aarhus talking about cognition, uh, et cetera, et cetera. I mean, all these things are building up kind of what I would say, I'll get back to it, is lowering our error signals. We are getting closer to understanding each other. Therefore, cooperation gets easier. Uh, we do that all the time. I'm interested in why would people go from extended families to communities? I mean, this is not obvious. Our chimpanzee cousins and bonobos don't. They stay in kin groups, and, uh, and then the females just leave the group and join another group. So why would we do that? What's the advantage of doing it? Uh, the, uh, inspired by Roy Rappaport, the American ant uh, anthropologist, I'm, I'm interested in these. If we look at a lot of these groups where you are on the verge of creating communities, what's often called fission fusion communities, where, where people are, sometimes they are in the group and sometimes they don't. Actually, it's in Dirk Hames' book, which is interesting, in elementary forms, and people tend to oversee it. They say religion is sociogenesis genesis in, in in, in, in Durkheim's work. But it's interesting when he starts discussing ritual and ritual efficacy, he starts by saying half the year, the Australian Aboriginals walk around in bands, which is not what he's interested in. He's interested in when the bands come together. 
That means most of the year they are not in the group. They are actually in another group, in a smaller group, which is often related to, to what I call the nurture sphere, this, this kinship-based group. And I'll get back to what that means. So, so I, the idea can be, could be unfolded like this, that, that ritual is a stipulated behavioral specification. So, so what we usually take for granted in ritual is that there's some kind of constitutive rule, rule of, about how you are supposed to do the ritual, right? Ritual is a bit like playing chess. It's something, I mean, we decided that when you do these kind of things, you, you are playing chess, right? I mean, we can change the rule, and then, but then it's a new game. You can, of course, we know rituals are changing over time, but the interesting thing is that people that perform them usually say they don't. So people are really interested in that the rituals should be done the right way. Why is this the case? Probably because it's very, very hard to see the effect of any rituals, right? The only way we can judge whether the ritual is successful is whether it, it follows uh, our shared model of how the rituals should be done. I mean, that's the only way. How can you tell that the Eucharist had been performed? Only by observing the action sequence, right? How can you see if somebody had made tea or coffee? Well, I can just take the thermo up there and see, hey, there's coffee. Somebody had made coffee. I don't need to see the procedure. So that's the difference between the ritual. Nobody can go down in church late Sunday afternoon and say, hey, I know the, the, the Eucharist was performed here. How do you know? Only by, by kind of by, by habit, right? Uh, so, so stipulated behavior, we are agreeing upon what should be done. What's interesting in terms of the cognitive model that I uh, uh, delve into in a moment is that this, if we are asking people to follow a kind of sequence of behaviors, what we do is we are uh, aligning their mental model of what should be done. I mean, we're actually doing this with students every day when we teach, etc. We're trying to get them to align their mental model of what you do, right? If you teach somebody to cook, you're trying to make them create a model of how you do specific things, right? So we are aligning our model. And when we cooperate, take people who row a boat together. You need to synchronize your behavior, right? And when you do that, when you synchronize your behavior, you're actually aligning your mental models that are controlling your motor behavior. They become more and more the same. And people would, I mean, it's weird. People actually, you have studies that show you synchronize your heartbeat, et cetera, et cetera. It's, it's really, really a deep thing we do with each other. We imitate each other in small dyadic situations. We turn our heads the same way when we discuss with people. We use the same phrases, we change our dialects towards each other, et cetera. We do this spontaneously all the time. Now, in ritual, we are being told to follow a stipulated set of rules, right? So we have the action sequence, do this, and we all kind of align around the model. And the argument is that this facilitates prediction, at least in the ritual, I can predict what other people do, right? I mean, I can predict what the priest is doing in the, in the Eucharist. I can pretty much predict what other participants will do. I guess they're not going to spit out the bread, et cetera, et cetera. I mean, there's a lot of things that we don't think about, but this is still prediction. And my argument is that this helps coordinate behavior within the groups, also outside ritual. And there's actually a good deal of, of evidence for this, that, that having people perform rituals actually heightens loyalty towards the group afterwards. We Again, we do this with students every year. I mean, we make these kind of ritualistic things with new students that come in every year in order to create a team spirit, as we call it, right? They do it in private companies all the time. So these are effective things. Private companies wouldn't be doing this if it didn't work. Uh, so we can say that that this is actually making this kind of motor behavioral and eventually a symbolic alignment between people's model. By the way, I, I mean, I can easily send you this uh, presentation as a, as a PDF if, if, if you would like. So what's the underlying social and cognitive models, model of it? So here's a kind of really simplified uh, uh, depiction of what I call a social interaction sphere. So interaction spheres are actually old concept I found out. I mean, I had used the term already, and then I thought, hey, you better Google it and see if somebody... And then I found out that, uh, that archaeologists have been using it for kind of really dispersed behavior, uh, kind of patterns of ceramics and stuff like that. They say that's indication of an interaction sphere. I use it in a, in, a, in a more kind of restricted sense of any sphere that related to a functional domain, 
you guys are studying divination and magic and esoteric practices, you have kind of, you're creating a sphere in which there are larger interaction between you than there is outside, with outsiders. That's the only, it's kind of really low-key pragmatic uh, uh, definition. The argument then goes that all such systems create a kind of cultural system around it. It creates a conceptual structure or a relation between cultural models. So, of course, here we could say it's interesting how a research center do that when people come from around from different cultures. We, we tend to do it through, again, we have rituals, we have tea, and then we have talks, and then we go to a restaurant, etc. We do all these kinds of things in order to, to try to create this environment because we actually think something interesting going on. And what is often happening, what we aim at, is having some kind of mutual alignment. That doesn't mean everybody has to agree. It doesn't mean that, that we have identical uh, mental model. It just means that we are aligning our models to each other, and that makes coordination better. We all know that. If we work together with a colleague for 20 years, it's much easier writing a piece together than if you just met the person. Right? You have to check so many things out. Uh, so this is basically the argument that this enhances uh, social coordination. And the way of trying to describe it is that each individual, of course, create their own conceptual system. No individuals are totally alike, but it takes part in the cultural system around, and it would be more similar to others within the system than to our outsiders. Take a very simple example, language. I mean, we're all speaking within a language culture, language area, you're speaking more or less the same language. We also know that everyone speaks slightly different from anyone else, but we do know that it's still kind of within a sphere. We also know that this strong sphere is a quite new thing that came together with the nation states, but that's another discussion. Uh, now, if we look at what underlying cognitive model then would predict this, so, so the idea of this kind of really, I mean, really provocative new way of understanding cognition, and it's 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 so prevalent now because it's the best explanation so far we have of how cognition could relate to our neurological substrate. That has been a problem, that a lot of these theories have been totally disconnected. Cognitive theories have been computational and not really fitting very well to what we know about the brain. This one does, because what it does, it's, it's, it's arguing for a very parsimonious system. So uh, just a small anecdote, actually, a lot of the ideas came out of, of in how we transfer information. So, you know, when you have your television, so we, we know, I mean, the old ones, right, with pixels. And, and it they went into color. It was an explosion of how much information you had to send. Imagine if you had to send information for each pixel in the screen about what color it should be. That's a lot of information. So somebody came up with a brilliant idea and said, hey, what about if we say we have one pixel and then the, all the pixels around that, we only tell it if it should be different from the one already there. Only, so in the language here, only if there's a prediction error, it has to do something else. Otherwise, just do the same, which is really smart, right? I mean, if you have a black surface, it's pretty neat that the pixel just next to it is also black. You don't have to inform it about that. It does so automatically locally instead of having to transmit information. So the idea is the brain pretty much do the same. We always predict what comes next on all levels. It's down to each cell in your, in your visual system. A, a, a glia cell in the eye will be firing only if it's not getting what it predicts it will get over time. And that explains a lot of the phenomenon we know, et cetera. So the idea is you have predictions for the sensory input and the only information going upstream is when these predictions are wrong. Of course, they are wrong all the time at various levels of organization, right? So I moved this cup now. In order to do that, I had an idea I wanted to move the cup. I changed the world. There was a prediction now, et cetera, et cetera. All these are kind of really complex model, but the basic system is really, really simple. It's just kind of following this. And the current experience of the world is then a product of our models and our updating of these models constantly, right? The interesting thing now, which had, which caught our interest in when studying religion, is that there are probability estimates related to both of these these uh, procedures. So I have an idea about how strong my prediction is. 
So let's say it's been, it, I'm walking around the same lake every time. There's usually swans there. I see some white stuff out in the middle of the lake. I say it's swans, right? I mean, even though actually, if we look at what you are able to see, it's pretty poor, but you have a very strong probability estimate of that there are usually swans here, right? So even if there's something that didn't quite look like a swan, you're probably gonna give a low probability estimate to your error signal and say, it's just, I mean, it's just a light or something, right? So you downregulate the error signal. But you can also have the reverse. Let's say I'd walk around a lake in Africa where I've never been before. I would say, I better open my eyes, as we say, because I have really, really weak models of what I expect to see. So I'm really open for that my models might be wrong. And I have to update them and ask people, what is that bird? It's not the swan I thought it was. <clears throat> the argument then goes that, that we should understand the brain as a deeply, deeply complex and hierarchical structure in which the output of lower level functions as the input of higher level. And the higher level always tries to predict what, what it will experience. And again, I know this is a kind of fast introduction to it, but let me try with an example that might, might help out. This is called a binocular rivalry. So the, the experimental setup was actually de devised already in the Renaissance by an Italian guy. I forgot his name now, and I didn't write it down, but it's in the book. Uh, but, it, but lately, it was produced by psychologists. So you give people a pair of weird glasses in which on the left side, the left eye will be shown a picture of a woman's face, and the right eye is shown a house. Now, we, if you have a bottom-up approach to perception, you would expect, hey, there'll be some kind of weird mix mixture between a face and a house. But that's not what people say they experience. They either experience a face or a house. And over time, they oscillate between the two and have very, very, very short transitions in which there's a mix. Now, if we take the model before, right, there's a very, very weak model of face houses. We don't see them often around. So actually, the brain will settle for a much, much stronger model, either a house or a face. And as soon as it settles for one, the error signal from, from the other eye seems to grow and grow and grow and grow. And the brain says, oh, something's wrong here. I better change model. Switch to the other one. And then, of course, the error signal goes again. And people will oscillate between the two persons. So it shows you how strong our models are and how much they decide what we actually experience. And of course, we know this from a lot of other examples of so-called gestalt switch, right? It's very hard to see both the rabbit and the dog, but you can easily switch between them. when you Once you kind of crack the code, we can switch between them, but we can't mix them. And this is then, of course, my favorite, where the whole thing breaks down because the global structure doesn't work, but there's nothing wrong with any of the local structures, right? So the global picture is impossible, but but all uh, locality is is right. So this is of course exploiting the, the negative group and and the gestalt switch uh, relating to that one. So what has that to do with our concepts on a higher level? Now the idea. So so what I'm trying to do is say, okay, this is a perceptual model. Uh, what, how do we kind of understand what culture is about now? I mean, how do we go from, from these really basic experiences to what culture is about? So take, so I use the example of a cat. A cat is a kind of, it, it's a term is usually called a, a basic level category, right? We have easy access to it. It's a short word. It's easy to translate between most countries, um, between most languages. Uh, we have, I mean, strong motor behavioral models of how you engage with cat, how they are likely to behave, et cetera, et cetera. It's actually a, a pretty wild model of cat we have. If we expand it into cultural history, I mean, cats have been both sacred and demonic. They are uh, representing women's sexuality in a positive way and also in a negative way and all this kind of stuff. I mean, the, the cultural history of cats are deep. Now, so what about the Cheshire cat from, from Alice's adventures in, in, in Wonderland? I mean, we see there's a clear extension of the model here, right? The Cheshire cat doesn't exist, eh? but still we, we kind of, and Carol is playing around with our kind of basic knowledge, right? It's appearing in a neurological way. It's, it's, it's head or its ears or its eyes. There's a 
wonderful quote I use in the book by Alice standing there waiting to tell the cat about the cro uh, croquet uh, experience with, with the queen. Uh, and, and she's kind of, oh, okay, it's only the eyes are here. I better wait to tell him until the ears have appeared, right? I mean, so there's a deep common sense at the same time as you have this kind of weird scenario of this kind of cat appearing. And, and then, uh, as you wrote, so kind of, yeah, and the cat decided apparently after its head had appeared, enough of it. It didn't kind of bother to make the rest appear. So, so we can easily talk about that. The interesting thing is these are gaining kind of cultural prevalence, right? You have actually a psychological syndrome that's called the Alice in Wonderland syndrome, where people feel kind of spatially disconnected. Uh, we could say that that somebody is a real Cheshire cat, or you could say this is a like a, 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 a red queen's uh, gambit or something like that. You, we can exploit the story by referring to real world events by using this model and see how shared this model is. It's not just one person running around with it. This is as the publisher would say, they're part, part of the cultural heritage. So I'm trying to analyze this further, how, how we are creating common models and how these common models are stabilizing our own cognitive system. So putting a word on the cat here is stabilizing our predictions relating to it, and it's, in, it's further incorporation between people. And of course, then we can extend it all the way. This is Maggie the cat. If you know Cat on a Hot Tin Roof by Tennessee William uh, from mid-50s. So, so here you see kind of an extreme extension, right? She's called a cat because she was a model. But it's also a cat on a hot tin roof means a person which is in a very precarious situation without jumping off. She's never getting off the roof. Uh, but again, cat can be used. So see how the extension of the model is used within a culture. Now you could talk about this might be fine culture and not everyone will know that game or that play anymore, but they sure did, I mean, 50 years ago, because this was a big, uh, big Broadway success. So how do we understand what's going on here in terms, I'm returning to the model here, and then we can put in some, some, some action, right, that this is constantly developing. So we have predictions about what other people would say mean by a Cheshire cat, for instance. And if they then apparently mean something completely different, I either have to persuade them, you are wrong, your model is wrong. Or I have to change my model. But so we experience prediction error when our communi communication doesn't work, right? But imagine how much we tell each other all the time where we don't experience these kinds of errors. We are seamlessly integrating our models about how we make tea and who stands to one side, etc. I mean, and then we go to Britain and then we bump into people all the time because we're used to going to the right and not the left, right? So you have, of course, these, these uh, structures of... Um, of, of a habit that comes with it, it helps us coordinate behavior, right, at all levels of interaction. So what has this to do with magic? Okay, sorry for this detour, but it's it's sometimes necessary. So so I'm, I'm returning to, to the old idea of uh, Marcel Moss and Henri Hubert. I love finding these old pictures, right? Uh, I mean, he looks like a wild guy, uh, uh, Moss. I think he was actually. Um, but I mean, Moss and Hubert, they argue that magic is the appropriation of manner or representation of sort of force that emerges as a function of social interaction. So they argued, I mean, this idea of, of sacredness and that things can be special is something we do when we congregate, right? It's a, it's a function of sociality. And then they said magic is kind of the e, kind of anti-social appropriation of that force. And therefore, they were criticized for it, and they actually almost acknowledged it in the book. That problem is they almost end up equating, equating magic with sorcery. So they have no positive magic. It's really hard for them to, to get into their framework. It has to be kind of antisocial and individualistic. Uh, Durkheim, of course, in, in a certain sense, in the same uh, uh, precision, right? So religion is what's bringing communities together. But as you said, there's no church of magic. There are only clients, right? So it's individualized. Again, it's about individuals and not groups. And I think they are basically wrong because what, I mean, they are right in a number of senses. And I think they're kind of on the way. The problem is that uh, they disregard the magical rituals, have this kind of context near and pragmatic and efficacious aspect, and that they maybe are related to things that I would argue is not 
individualized. I think that's a kind of modernized way of thinking of it, but, but it's related to the family or to the nurture sphere. I mean, it's related to this kinship group, and that is where the problem is. So magic, I see it as re active rituals aimed to reduce potential tension between two social spheres here, the nurture sphere and the community sphere. So let me try to explain what these spheres are about. So the reason I, I ended up with this notion of the nurture sphere was I was looking into a lot of, there's a lot of research into how cooperation between humans uh, arise. Some of you probably heard about Michael Tomasello, which I think he's in Leipzig. Uh, he's worked extensively on this and it's fascinating stuff. It's about how, I mean, kids are kind of, I mean, innately cooperative. I mean, you have a one-year-old toddler and you have a, a a grown up coming in with a lot of books and stuff, and, and the toddler would kind of spontaneously try to help. And it's amazing how this kind of interaction. So they are talking about kind of this theatic stuff, right? That 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 we are, it's about caregiving. So every child is brought into a family. It's a fatty communication. That was a concept I think Malinowski phrased once. It's kind of fatty communication as we know it from when we say nice weather today. It's not that we actually are talking about the weather, right? We are engaging each other. We are recognizing each other as persons, right? I mean, it's a, it's a, I mean, at least I got very confused when Americans said, how are you? In the beginning, I thought I actually had to answer it until I found out that this was just kind of a greeting, right? It was not kind of, it wasn't a question at all. They didn't care less how I felt, really. <laughs> it was actually pretty embarrassing. So. What struck me when I got into the anthropological literature, it seemed to me that that I used the whole piece as example because I mean, guess that was in Aarhus was was an expert in that. That even, uh, but also I mean, in in uh, in Malinowski's work on the Tropianders and the Ascendi cases, very often it's actually the family that's the basic economic unit. Uh, they are the ones that grow the fields or hurt the the animals. They are the ones that uh, usually have most spreading of our kind of giving away of resources within the family. You might have exchange with the other families. That's not a question. But in a certain sense, it's the family that is the economic unit. And that's where, I mean, people go into a basic loyalty with their family, right? We talk about blood is thicker than water, etc. We have all these sayings that point to it. We Romeo and Julia, right? It's about one long story about loyalty to the clan or the family in contrast to loyalty towards the community. And it's the ontogenetic environment we all grew up in, at least as a normal. I mean, of course, we had other cases. This doesn't mean that you cannot have social arrangement in which children are brought up elsewhere. But I would argue it's actually one of the ways that the communities are trying to bolster themselves. So what is the problem for these spheres? Well, you have problem of ritual fidelity. You have problems of procuring food, of course. You have problems of security, you have problems of fertility, you have problems of health, death, all this. You might be able to come up with other stuff that seems to belong mostly in that area. The argument, my argument would be, and this is a hypothesis, that most magic or magical rituals around the world are about these problems. Most divinations, I know that because I actually checked pretty much up on whatever I could find. Most divination that people attend to is about these problems. It's about whether I should take on this travel. Is it dangerous? Is my wife unfaithful to me? Uh, what will happen to our harvest this year? Et cetera, et cetera. These are really the questions people are addressed. Why are they problematic from the community sphere's perspective? Because this indicates where you might have an unequal distribution of luck within a community. And if we know anything, we know what this produces, right? So let me, we make a thought experiment. You guys are sitting here and I arbitrarily decide that half of you should have doubled your salary. That would probably piss off the other half pretty strongly, right? So why do they deserve that? And so unequal distribution of luck, which happens everywhere. I mean, the harvest might fail on one lot and not the other, produces a lot of problems, right? One way to go about this problem is to embed them inside the community sphere. What's the community sphere interested in? Well, it's really a coalition of these families, right? So they are basically a search, they are very good at protection. Uh, they are 
better at doing energy extraction. So that's the kind of uh, the stack hunt dilemma or the stack hunt game in economics, right? I mean, if we are five people, we can hunt a stack. If we are, if I'm by myself, I can only hunt rabbits. So we can extract more energy when we cooperate. We can also store energy, which is an interesting thing, which also, of course, makes us uh, vulnerable to exploitation and rates. So we need protection. As soon as you have storage, you need, need to protect yourself. We also, uh, uh, symbolic communication also emerged at this level, right? You, you don't have languages that are family specific. You probably don't develop languages until you start congregating in communities because you don't need them. I mean, you can get along with fatic communication with, I mean, you have, I mean, people who are married who don't talk to each other for 20 years and it still works. I mean, and it's grunts and, and kind of small words. And, and, and we go along, you can get a long way if you really know each other without saying anything, right? And you have an extended loyalty towards the group, but that is not something that just comes about. Uh, in the book, I'm describing what I call reach, uh, rights of disruption uh, as a new take on why a lot of initiation rituals in weak communities are very violent. It's about freshing out the loyalty of the family of the children towards and, and redirecting it towards the community. So the community, so the nurture spheres, the family have to give up their children to the community and allowing them to beat up their own children. And this is, is a costly signal for loyalty from the family towards the society and not from the individual. Uh, okay, so what, what types of problems uh, are, are, are they facing? Well, I mean, one of the basic problems is then, of course, internal opposition that people would say, I mean, why I hate these guys over there. I mean, Romeo and Julia is breaking the, the city apart, right? This clan feud between two families. But we see this, I mean, study, even Spitzer's study of the Lure. Uh, there's so many descriptions about uh, the leopard skin priest who are really about reconciling different clans whenever there's been an accident or accidental death or something to prevent feuds from going on. So it's very much a prevention of internal distribution, and it's based on this uneven distribution of blood. Of course, there are external image, uh, enemies as well, and we have a problem of both loyalty and also of preservation of knowledge. We tend to forget, I think that was one of Malinowski's great insights, that this is kind of, actually, I mean, a small-scale society of 150, 200, 500 people, it actually matters when people die, because the knowledge is in people's brains, and that knowledge is gone when they're dead. So how do we ensure transmission of knowledge? So, so this can be depicted pretty much like this, that you have all these nurture spheres and they are then trying to kind of engage. And this means some kind of hierarchical interaction. It doesn't mean that it's coercion. It just means that you have a hierarchical structure and can be totally democratic. But it, it has this idea that, that once we agree, everybody has to follow, right? So there's this kind of hierarchical structure going on. Let me just come up with two examples, and then we are about to, um, about to finish. So you have the trophy and garden magic. I guess a lot of you have, have read about, I mean, Malinowski's description. If you haven't ever read the, his monography, I can recommend, I mean, Cold Garden and the Magic is as fantastic books, and, and it's amazingly uh, good uh, ethnography. Um, this is the garden magician. All these people are growing yams uh, in this in beautiful garden. What I'm interested in here is, is, is I mean, you could take a lot of the examples, but, but what happens every year when you clear the field, so this is a slash burn agriculture, you, you, have, um, uh, you have the allotment of space to the matrilineal families. So what you, if I was married, my, I would grow crops for my wife's brother, actually. I would hand up all I made, so I better have a sister, right? So I get something from the other side. Uh, so I grow, grow all this food um, into the mat matrilineal clan, and the allotment of the spaces are then done. And what you have then is the garden magician doing rituals on the exemplary plot, which is usually the, the big man in the society's plot. He's doing this kind of ritual uh, of fertility. He's doing, I mean, you have rituals all through the agricultural years, but he's doing it on that plot alone, and it's kind of supposed to spread on to the other ones. Nobody's allowed to work that day. It's, it's a purely ritual day, and it's, in, it's actually strongly related to what you call a socio-Sicardian rhythm. I mean, a, 
the society's own temporal structure related to the agricultural years. So it's really embedding what, what these rituals are about is ensuring fertility and protecting against pests, things that potentially would destroy a garden, not all of them. It would create this kind of uneven thing again. It might have grasshoppers totally smashing up one part and not touching the other one, or hurricane going through, destroying something and not others. So it's about kind of securing this. Look how all the anxieties produced that are related to the families are then kind of relocated into the community and is, is confirming the community conceptual structure, even though it might be disruptive. And I think that was one of Malinowski's insights as well, that, that all the anxieties produced needs to be kind of dealt with at a social level, because otherwise they become disruptive. If they're dealt with within, actually they can end up conforming or, or, or kind of uh, uh, undergirding the social structure, right? We all follow suit, we all do the ritual. Okay, so that could be called kind of an integrative aspect of ritual rights, integrating people together. But what about kind of reactive stuff? So there we have the Sandy Bingy Oracle and the magic that follows. So I think Evan Spritz's description there is, is kind of interesting because what he's of course not arguing in terms of, of cognitive structures, but he's showing how these, these uh, practices relate and actually ends up conforming the social structure rather than disrupting them. So you have sickness, uh, infertility, all these kinds of problems I relegate before that touches on the nurture sphere. And then what you what you want to do is you need to find what is the reason behind this. And, and interesting enough, what you do is you're transforming problems into social problems, right? The witch is a, it's, a, it's another person. And you are, so, so some of you might hurt, so you do this kind of uh, uh, oracle, right? You put some poison, which is magical medicine, down the throat of a, of a chicken. And then, and you ask a question, and if it dies, it's it's confirmative, and if it if it doesn't die, it's a negation of the question. You have to do it twice, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And if it's really serious allegation, you have to go to the princely court, and that has to confirm confirm the oracle once again. But what what it's really about is pinpointing the witch who's who's to blame for the misfortune. And what you do then is you take off the wing of the dead fowl, and you go and throw it in front of the person who was who you said it was, and you say, cool down your witchcraft, in kind of my translation, right? Uh, and because the underlying cultural model is you can be a witch without knowing. So you could be eating this other person's organ at night. This is your ghost soul moving out, and they are all cannibals, of course. They eat the other's organs, and you might do that without knowing it. So, so now you've been told you're a witch, okay, okay, okay. I relax and look how self-confirmatory this is because we know that 75% of all diseases it go away by themselves. So in 75% of all these cases, it would be confirmed that this helps. He cooled down his witchcraft. Now I'm not sick anymore, right? So there's a kind of, so here you see another example where it's kind of reaction to something that happened. Shit, we had an accident. We are sick. We Our field burnt down, whatever. You're transposing it into a social structure a, a stipulated ritual argued by everyone this is the right way to do it and the right way to understand it and the right way to treat it and therefore in a certain sense your misfortune ends up confirming this community structure once again and we also know from all these cases who is usually uh, uh, allegated of being witches are those who do not share those who are, do not put in resources into the communities and almost always those who are called witches. It's not the only one. You also have misfits, et cetera, et cetera. But it's very often people who are kind of on the fringes of community for one or another reason. So it's a very, very strong incentive at the same time to stay within the community structure because otherwise you're a witch. In, in, in the Hopi uh, language, a witch is called kahobi, which means a non-human. Actually, because Hopi, of course, means human. Uh, so, but that's a, a generalized one. So, I think this is about the last one. 
So what 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 should we make of this? Because some of you might say, okay, now you studied a lot of indigenous people, and what does I mean? I know you guys are most interested in, in the satiric traditions and more learned traditions, and and some of you are more, maybe more interested in what happens then when when societies get bigger, right? I mean, what happens when social groups get bigger? Because this is this is an interesting case, and actually this are, is actually hypotheses that are generated based. On the models you saw before, so what? So what would happen there? At least it becomes, I think, a, a magic becomes a polemical concept because of struggle over loyalty and power. So we see what states are doing is, if, if we look at the old empires and religions, they are really empires of communities. Uh, I mean, the, I mean, Romans, you might have a degree of integration, but most of the time, you say, I mean, you can do whatever you want in your small community as long as you pay your tribute or your tax. And you don't oppose the internet. So don't uprise, don't do anything violent. You can keep your language, you can pray to your God. We couldn't care less. What about the Roman Catholic Church? Pretty much the same structure. A lot of rituals were going on in the in the villages that was not exactly something they liked in Rome, but they didn't give a shit. It was just farmers. I mean, what was important was what the monks were doing, what the elite was doing. It didn't nobody in the Middle Ages cared about what, what uh, peasants in some community thought about God or the Trinity or whatever. So you, so the argument would be you had a lot of this magic, witchcraft, allegations, etc. All that was going on just on a local scale, and the church didn't care. But what happens at, at a certain time, you have early states. And when the states are, are consolidating, we get a competition for loyalty. And because loyalty and the states is very, very often connected up with particular versions of a religion and, and especially of the ritual expressions, right? So, so the, of course, the Treaty of Westphalen is, is, is exemplary here. So everybody has to have the same religion as, as the local prince or, or earl or whatever he was. You follow your, your sovereign, right, in, in your religious allegation. So suddenly what you believe become actually a a costly signal of loyalty. Suddenly you are showing off who are you loyal to by your religious behavior. Oops, suddenly the magic that was going on in the community was actually a competition to the loyalty of the state. So suddenly all those, the religions become connected to the state and, and it is at the exact same time that people start making that you have an explosion of witchcraft delegations and trials that are brought into the stately sphere. And it's believed, it's exactly argued to be kind of heresies. It's against the religion, right? So, it's, it's, so magic is becoming a polemical term because states see it as illicit ritual behavior that is consolidating communities that are potential conflict in terms of loyalty to the overarching structure. Um, so, so in that sense, the witchcraft case is caused by actually fundamentalism of early state religion. I mean, uh, uh, what we see at least in Europe, and again, this is a, this is a hypothesis, so I'm interested in how it would work in, in other instances of, of actual age religion and institutionalized religion, but I do think there are some of the same patterns, at least in India. Uh, that you have this kind of fundamentalist, as soon as it gets connected to the political sphere, there's the idea that it has to govern every aspect of life suddenly. And it's not just a kind of a, a centralized around a holy centers. And that follows a, also often a de-ritualization of, of religion. Maybe de-ritualization is a wrong word. What I mean by it is at least that the rituals are transformed into signs of loyalty rather than efficacious actions. So you show who your loyalty by the ritual and you have to stand, and therefore the rituals become more and more standardized. And, and there's a high suspicion if people are using these rituals for what Durkheim was then saying for their private ends, but it's not really, it's the nurture sphere and how that relates to community that these rituals were about. Um, and that would point to my, that's then the last point that what, what then about modernity? And Ben asked me this question while we were having lunch today, because I think it's really, really interesting. So one, one, the way I see it and the, what I'm trying to, to argue in the book is that, that what, that, that the idea of, of, 
autonomous individuals are really part of this modernization. I mean, I'm of course not the first one saying this. I mean, a huge inspiration from Charles Taylor, but also Levi Brühl and others who have been looking into this, how are people's representation of self in different societies. Melanesian anthropology have recently kind of excavated the same idea again about individuation in contrast to individualization. And, and the argument here is that, that, that in, in small scale societies, you might have different roles, social roles, but they are all defined relative to a social sphere. So you might be a part of a medicine right or whatever. Your different identities relating to these different subspheres of the community are all ritually regulated. You don't have to think about how they relate. They are related, and we all know how they're related. And this group has to perform this ritual, that group has to perform that ritual, et cetera, et cetera. In modernity, that connection is totally obliterated. So we all participate in numerous spheres. You all walk out from here later after, after having dinner at a restaurant, and then you enter into different social spheres of family and friends or whatever. Uh, you might do something else in Christmas. Now we change sphere again. We go home, we travel, et cetera. But nothing is connecting these spheres for us. We have to do that ourselves, right? So again, this is Sloterdijk. All kinds of people have pointed to this problem of modernity, of the kind of uh, kind of uh, fragmented reality of the modern condition. Now, my argument there, would, my take on it is that strong individual autonomy is a is a cognitive immune reaction to this state. We have to form strong selves in order to relate how we engage in all these systems. So it's not, so I'm kind of turning it upside down. A lot of people say modernity is fragmenting the self. I'm actually arguing the opposite. It's what is creating strong selves. Now, the problem of that is, of course, it's, very, it's pretty difficult and hard. And therefore we get a number of kind of immune technologies, I think, in order to bolster that. And one of them is where magic comes in. I think it's, it's, it's related to what I try to, what I call the spiritual theoretical immune program. So, so that's besides the two others I, I point to, there might be more, is a political religious one, of strong ideology, and the aesthetic economic one of how I appear and self, economic self-dependency. So I can pay my own ways, right? But the spiritual uh, therapeutic is interesting because it's an idea of searching for the true inner self all the time, of the genuine self, right? So you, you're seeking that core that would unite everything that makes everything kind of come together as a whole. Of course, that search is probably perpetual. We never find it. But what it does is creating a very agile self that is, is ready to transform itself. And I think that's the reason why private companies are embracing these techniques with great joy, right? I mean, all big companies have mindfulness courses, et cetera, et cetera. They want to build strong subjects because that's good for earning. Uh, and people don't get sick all the time, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and I think magic has transformed into being a part of that. I think all magic today is basically private. We don't do it for our extended family. We might do it for our small nuclear family, but that's a different story I can't go into here. But, but we basically do it for ourselves. Magical procedures is about self-enhancement today and, and, and self-progress. It's not about a community. It's not about a nurture sphere. And therefore, it's not really a competition to the state. doesn't care. It's okay. Do whatever you want, individuals, in my sovereignty, because this is not a threatening thing at all. It's actually far less threatening than the political, religious approach to kind of self-bolstering or whatever we could call it. Okay, that was a... I know this was trying to cover kind of a lot of things, but I also wanted to kind of say some of the stuff I'm discussing in this. So now I'll shut up and let other people pose questions. So thanks.